Good evening, I am Jack Fuji and welcome to the second session of Agriculture 194R, Focus on Agriculture. Agriculture 194R is a one credit course offered by the College of Agriculture, Forestry and Natural Resource Management here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. This class comes to you live each Thursday evening from 7 to 8.30 p.m. from the television studios located in the Mo'okini Library on the University of Hawaii at Hilo campus. And tonight we are also coming to you live from the Kaikendall Hall uh, studios at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This evening we're going to talk about adaptive radiation or speciation uh, or evolution of a lot of the uh, animal life that we have on, uh, the, in the state of Hawaii. And for those of you joining us for the first time, Focus on Agriculture is a class to inform you about the various uh, aspects of diversified agriculture. And each semester we focus on a different subject area and this semester we're focusing on Hawaii's natural resources and conservation biology in Hawaii. Before we go on I'd just like to, uh, if I may have the Elmo, uh, if you have any questions regarding the class Agriculture 194R you can get a hold of me at uh, the uh, University of Hawaii actually College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management, or CAFNARM, University of Hawaii at Hilo, 200 West Kawili Street, Hilo, Hawaii. And also, if you'd like to uh, get a hold of me by the phone, uh, that's 808-974-7393, or you can fax me at 808-974-7674, or those of you on the internet, you can email me at jfuji at hawaii.edu. And I just might also add that uh, tomorrow is the last day uh, to sign up for the class. So if there are any of you that would like to sign up for Focus on Agriculture this semester, uh, you have to make sure you have your registration forms in by tomorrow, uh, 4.30 p.m. Since we are coming to you live this evening at approximately 8 p.m., those of you in the viewing audience and of course those of you here in the classroom can ask questions of our guest speaker. And of course those of you on the outer islands of Oahu, uh, Maui, and Kauai, Molokai, Lanai, you can call us collect and of course those of you here on the big island can call us direct. I hope you don't change the channel. We have another very interesting presentation for you. And as I mentioned earlier, this evening we're going to talk about uh, the adaptive radiation or speciation of many of our uh, creatures, animal life that we have uh, in the state of Hawaii. This evening, my guest is Dr. Kenneth Kaneshiro. Uh, Dr. Kaneshiro is the director of the Center for Conservation Research and Training at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's also on the graduate faculty uh, of the entomology department at the University of Hawaii. And uh, at this time, uh, it gives me great pleasure to turn the class over to uh, Dr. Kaneshiro. So Ken, why don't you take over the class? Thank you, Jack, and good evening. Um, unfortunately, we've got a bit of a technical problems with the computer, uh, which contained all of my slides for the presentation tonight. Um, there is a computer technician that's rushing up on its way up to see if he can uh, correct this problem, but um, I'm not sure how long that will take. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, I will do my best to um, get started with my presentation and hopefully um, we can um, get hooked up with the computer and show you some of these pictures of these, uh, of these insects. Uh, that I've been working on for a number of years. Um, I do have some text on the computer which um, may actually um, can be used as at least in this early part. So maybe if we can go to the slides, um, uh, we, we might be able to <clears throat> at least get started on some of this, uh, my presentation. I, I usually like to start with this slide um, which is <clears throat> titled, Nothing in Biology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. And this was a title of a presentation by uh, Professor Theodosius Dobzhansky, who is one of the fo foremost biologists, evolutionary biologists uh, in, in the US. 
And he made this presentation between, uh, before the National Association of Biology Teachers uh, almost 25 years or a little more than 25 years ago now. And uh, I, I show this slide because Hawaii really is, um, and it's too bad again we don't have the slides uh, coming up properly. Hawaii is a natural laboratory and really the best place in the world for studying evolutionary biology. Um, so for teaching biology, basic concepts of biology, and especially evolutionary biology, Hawaii is really the best place in the world to do this. Now there are s several points that makes Hawaii so special for evolutionary research and, ev and teaching evolutionary biology. And again, I, I don't know what uh, we'll be able to do in um, the next few slides where I'll be able to show you e examples of each of these things, but let me at least start going through this. Some of this was uh, presented by Dr. Carson last week, so it will be repetitious, uh, but I thought it would be good to um, refresh your memory on, on these key points. Um, the first thing is that is isolation. Hawaii is, is very much isolated. It's one of the most isolated landmass uh, in the world, sitting in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I said, uh, let me try to get back to these points uh, in the next few slides. Also, uh, we have um, a sequential formation of islands. And again, Dr. Carson went into quite a bit of detail expl explaining this sequential formation of islands. Also, we have um, known ages of the islands. We know approximately the age of Kauai and Oahu and so on down the line. And that's a very important part of our research on evolutionary biology. The next thing is that there's fragmentation. Um, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail explaining what I mean by fragmentation. Um, then we have a tremendous diversity of plants and animals that are found in Hawaii, that are unique to the Hawaiian Islands and found only in Hawaii. And among those plants and animals, there are special groups of species uh, with which we can do some um, very sophisticated um, multidisciplinary research, uh, all the way from morphology to ecology to behavior, uh, DNA work, and so on. Um, again, uh, unfortunately, there would have been a very nice picture of the islands uh, from a satellite shot of the islands showing uh, the big island and um, Maui, Molokai, Lanai, and um, Kauai. But uh, for some reason, this computer is not be able to show that. And this next slide would have shown you um, the Pacific Basin, actually. And again, this is something that Dr. Carson covered last week. But it would have shown you the, the Pacific Basin with Hawaii sitting right in the middle of the Pacific Basin, almost equal distance from the uh, west coast of California, of, the no of North America with California and uh, Japan on the east, e eastern side. Um, but just to emphasize the point that Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, is a very isolated landmass sitting smack by uh, exactly in the middle of the Pacific Basin. Yeah. <clears throat> Again, this, this slide isn't showing up well because it would have, we would have shown you the islands, um, uh, island chain here, showing the, um, <clears throat> how the islands were formed over this hot spot here and with the Pacific plate moving in this northwesterly direction. Kauai was in this position about 5.1 million years ago. And as the plate moves, I think Dr. Carson mentioned about three and a half inches per year. Um, after 5.1 million, million years, Kauai is now in this position. Uh, the big island is still being formed uh, with Kilauea still erupting. And at this hot spot right now, there is a new island being formed, the island called Loihi. And perhaps a few million years from today, this island will be above surface. But again, the whole point uh, of this slide was to show that there is this sequential formation of islands from Kauai down the island chain to the big island of Hawaii. And um, that's, that's a very important aspect of our being able to understand the patterns of evolution. Um, okay. All right. Okay, apparently, um, they're bringing a 
new computer uh, so that we might be able to show these slides um, with, with the pictures. Um, I'll, I'll just go ahead and continue and work with what we have right now, although we may not be able to see um, these pictures. <clears throat> um, this slide would have shown you um, the volcanism, the current volcanism, and how um, the, a forest that was at one time a very large and continuous forest uh, because of active and current volcanism is now cut into small patches of forest so that you have islands of vegetation surrounded by a sea of lava. And these islands of vegetation, the Hawaiians call kipukas. And again, these are important components of the geology and the climate of Hawaii that has contributed to this very explosive speciation uh, evolutionary process in the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and as I mentioned in, in the earlier slide, we also have um, this tremendous diversity of plants and animals and the birds. Again, I'm sorry for this, but there would have been a picture of a bird um, in, in, in this shot. Uh, we have tremendous diversity of the plants with ohias and silver swords um, that are found in the Hawaiian Islands and that are unique to the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and these very spectacular land snails, I think Dr. Carson showed you a few examples of these um, land snails um, um, in his presentation last week. Now, as I mentioned, among these plants and animals that are found in the Hawaiian Islands and that are unique to the Hawaiian Islands, there are special groups of species that allow us to do very sophisticated multidisciplinary research research um, um, all the way from straightforward morphology and ecology, behavior, physiology, developmental biology, um, and even DNA analysis that um, allow us to better understand evolutionary processes um, that go on in, these, in, in the plants and animals of Hawaii. Now, the one group of um, insects, uh, one group of organisms that I've been working on for uh, many years. I, actually, I started on this uh, Hawaiian Drosophila project back in 1963. So I've been working on this project for um, nearly 35 years now. And it's, it's been a team project, um, team effort, with more than 70 senior scientists that's been involved in this project. Um, and over the 35 years of research, um, there's been more than 450 papers that's been published uh, documenting the various aspects of the biology of this group. Um, I think we have um, another disk that's been brought over, and we'll, we want to try to see whether this will work or not. So if you give me uh, about uh, 30 seconds or so, uh, we'll give this a try. I just like to uh, mention one more time that uh, there is time to sign up for Agriculture 194R, and tomorrow is the last day to sign up for the uh, class. Uh, it should be a very interesting class. We have uh, 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 the next class on Thursday will cover a lot of our native plants, and then the following Thursday will cover our native birds and, and all about uh, the various uh, species of of native birds that we have in Hawaii. And also, uh, after that, let's see if I can go to my course syllabus here. Uh, then we'll be talking about our native spiders. We have uh, Dr. Rosemary Gillespie at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, a researcher there, and she'll be uh, making a presentation on the unique uh, spiders that we have in Hawaii. Then. Uh, we'll go more towards the water, and uh, it looks like uh, Ken's slides are, are really working over there, so uh, 
I guess he can move back and uh, get get to his computer and uh, uh, get the beautiful slides that he has uh, on. I, it looks like it's working now, but uh, after that, on February 18th, uh, we'll start talking about Hawaii's water resources, and then we'll talk about the biology of uh, Hawaiian streams and talk about the various uh, native species that are found in our native uh, streams, and then we'll talk about uh, the impact of the marine aquarium fish industry and the tourist industry on our coral reefs. And then we'll go on to uh, talk about uh, the management of our coral reefs. And we'll also talk about the uh, bottom fish that we have uh, in the waters around Hawaii. And for all of you fishermen, that should be a very interesting presentation for you. And then we have on March 25th is a spring recess. And, oh, and I get word that Ken is uh, ready. So Ken, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, uh, I think we may have, may have it working now. So let me very quickly um, <clears throat> go back to the slides and uh, some of the slides that we missed earlier on. I'll just go through them very quickly. Um, this is the slide where we showed the isolation of the islands. And this is a shot uh, from NASA, which shows a satellite view of the islands. And then here's that shot I ex tried to explain how the Hawaiian Islands is sitting in the middle of the Pacific Basin, uh, just right in the middle. And then, of course, this is the one that shows the sequence of island formation, which, again, Dr. Carson covered, so I won't spend any more time here. And then here's that shot in which I tried to explain how active volcanism today can actually form these islands of vegetation um, in which populations of plants or insects or snails may be trapped and uh, become separated from another forest back here, which was at one time connected. But now this lava flow has separated them into separate islands of vegetation, which the Hawaiians call the kipukas. And this is a very important part of the um, evolutionary process. And I, I mentioned the birds, the Hawaiian birds, um, the plants. And I think Dr. Jim Jacoby will be talking about the uh, native plants next week. And the birds, uh, Dr. Sheila Kona will be talking about the birds in a couple of weeks, I think, from today. And land snails, um, again, <clears throat> Dr. Carson showed you a few of these, but just wanted to emphasize that there are these very unique forms uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, um, many of which are extinct today, and many others are in, on the endangered species list. I think there will be a speaker who will talk about the Hawaiian land snails um, in a few weeks. And then, as, as I explained, there are groups of species among these plants and animals uh, which allow us to do very sophisticated research. <clears throat> Now, as I, as I already said, the group that I've been working on for about 35 years now is the Hawaiian Drosophila, which has been a team effort of more than 70 senior scientists. And as I said, it's been more than 35 years now that we've been doing this research, resulting in more than 400 papers, scientific papers. <clears throat> Uh, the Hawaiian Drosophila at the present time is made up of 511 species that's been named and described. But we already have in the collection another 250 or 300 more species that are unnamed and undescribed uh, here at the uh, University of Manoa campus. So there's more than 200 species that are still needs to be named and, <clears throat> and described. And every time we go out into the field, even to localities where we have sampled extensively, we're still collecting new species. And my conservative estimate is that there may be as many as 1,000 species in the endemic Hawaiian Drosophila. These are species that are unique to the Hawaiian Islands. Now, in this slide, I just wanted to point out this last point. Of this 750, maybe 1,000 species, there's evidence, all the evidence indicates that the entire fauna, all this perhaps a 1,000 species, arose from maybe a single, but at the most, two 
individuals that arrived in the Hawaiian Islands X million years ago. Whether it's 10 or 20 or 30 million years ago, we're not sure yet, but we know for sure that this entire fauna, the one, uh, 1,000 species perhaps, arose from a single or perhaps at the most two founders that arrived in the Hawaiian Islands. Now here's what some of these flies look like. This one here on the bottom is Drosophila melanogaster, which is a cosmopolitan species. And this is the species that most um, geneticists elsewhere in the world use as their experimental animal to do various kinds of genetic experiments. But this fly here is Drosophila conspicua from the island of Hawaii, which is one of our spectacular Hawaiian Drosophila. And there we have many species that have the spectacular markings in the wing, which we call picture wings and all kinds of modifications on the morphology. I'll show you a, a few more very quickly. Here's Drosophila difference from the island of Molokai, and you can see it's got very intricate patterns on the thorax and the abdomen and wing patterns. Uh, this is Drosophila sylvestre, very bright eyes and um, enlarged antennae, um, all kinds of uh, modifications on the front leg, and which I'll show you some more uh, in, a, in a minute. Drosophila hedonura and Sylvestris, um, which are both found together in the Big Island. They're genetically very similar, and I'm going to talk about these two species in more detail in, in a minute. Okay, so if we can uh, turn off the slide just for a second. Um, here we have in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, if you take the Hawaiian Islands and put them all together, you have a landmass that is so small that perhaps you can fit it into the state of Connecticut, just to give you a perspective of how small a landmass we're talking about. Also, geologically, it's a very young landmass. If you just take uh, from the island of Kauai, which is about 5 million years old, re relative to the continents, for example, it's a very young landmass. And yet, we have in the Hawaiian Islands about perhaps a 1,000 species of this um, Hawaiian Drosophilidae, which are unique to the Hawaiian Islands. Now, based on present data, um, this 511 species that's been named and described represents about one quarter of the total number of species that's found in the world. So if you consider the small land mass, the Hawaiian Islands, and the geological newness of the Hawaiian Islands, that's an incredible number of species in just this one family of flies. Okay, so if we can go back to the slides again. So the question is, how come? What is it about the Hawaiian Islands that have given rise to this tremendous numbers of species? If you can go back to the slides, please. Yeah, one of the things that we found out very early on in our studies back in the early 60s was that the species that we found on Kauai were found only on the island of Kauai. Those that we found on Oahu were found only on Oahu, and so on down the line. In other words, 98% of the species are what we call single island endemics, found only on a single island. There are very few species in which are found on more than one island. The next thing uh, that we found was that even within a single island, for example, take the island of Maui, where you have West Maui and East Maui, Haleakala, uh, often we find <clears throat> on these two separate volcanoes very closely related, but different species. So even within a single island like Maui, we could have different species on the separate volcanoes. If you take the big island of Hawaii now, where there's five different volcanoes, for the most part, we're finding the same species that may be distributed throughout these five volcanoes. But um, we're finding already very significant genetic differences between the populations on the Kohala versus those on the Hualai versus on Mauna Kea and so on. So even though the, the species are all the same on these five volcanoes uh, on the Big Island, we're finding significant genetic differences between these uh, populations on the different volcanoes. Now here's that picture about the Kipukas now. And so even within the same volcano, like Kilauea, for example, or Mauna Kea, where you have these kinds of kipukas being formed, populations that are trapped in this particular forest back here in the background and the ones here in the foreground, even though they've been separated by this lava, full, lava flow uh, only about 100 years or so, we're already finding sig significant genetic differences between these populations. 
Okay, so between islands, you have different species. Between volcanoes within the same island, you may have different species. Even within the same volcano, you can have these kinds of pockets of islands, islands of vegetation like these kipukas in which there are genetic differences already developing. So these are all very important um, aspects of our study of the Hawaiian Drosophila that is helping us understand the evolutionary process that have given rise to these tremendous numbers of species. The next thing is that within in the Hawaiian Islands, we have a tremendous diversity of habitats within relatively short distances. For example, you take on the island of Oahu, the trade winds blow sort of in this direction here. And as they hit the Koalau mountain range, on the windward side, you have relatively high rainfall conditions. And on the leeward side, like for example, on the Waianae side of the island, you have relatively dry conditions. So within very short distances from the windward side where you have wet rainforest type conditions to the leeward side, you can have desert-like conditions. You have very extreme um, uh, environmental conditions. And our, our flies have adapted to um, these extreme types as well as everything in between. For example, on the big island of Hawaii in Pohakaloa, uh, in the saddle between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, you can have this forest, uh, which when you walk into this forest, you can see very sparse vegetation, not much of understory, uh, predominantly two, tr two species of trees here, very dry environment. The soil here is almost like talcum powder. Um, this area receives less than 25 inches of rainfall a year. Um, and yet we can find some of our Drosophila species in this habitat. On the other hand, you might have a forest like this, a rainforest, like on, uh, in uh, the Waikamoe Forest on the island of Maui, where you have very dense vegetation in the understory. You have many species of trees in the overstory. And you could have rainfall here approaching 250 inches of rainfall a year. So very high rainfall situations. Here's another um, shot of the same rainforest. And you can see. The branches of the trees here are so wet all the time that it's very heavily laden with uh, moss. And then you can go to the other extreme where you can have a swamp, like the Alakai Swamp, which is the main drainage for Mount Waia Ale Ale, um, which can average uh, up to 500 or 600 inches of rainfall a year. And, and many of you know that Mount Waia Ale Ale is uh, recognized as the wettest spot on Earth. So very, from very dry desert-like conditions like on Pahakaloa to very wet, extremely wet conditions like on uh, in Alakai Swamp and Mount Waialeale Ale on uh, Kauai, uh, you have a tremendous diversity of habitats uh, in which these, these um, native organisms can, can live. Now, the other thing about the Hawaiian Drosophila is that, um, well, let me go back a second. Drosophila from the rest of the world, like Drosophila melanogaster, the one I pointed out to you earlier, um, are, have been called fruit flies because they lay their eggs in decaying fruit. Um, the Hawaiian Drosophila, however, um, uh, ha there are very few fruits in the native ecosystem, the native vegetation, that are large enough for these very large species of Drosophila. This particular species of plant in the genus Claremontia happened to have a fairly large fruit. And so indeed, some of our Hawaiian Drosophila species will lay their eggs and the larvae will breed in this, uh, this fruit of Claremontia. But for the most part, most of our Hawaiian Drosophila utilize decaying leaves, decaying bark, even the decaying roots of various uh, native plants as their larva breeding site. Um, there are different species of ferns, and we have a number of species of uh, Hawaiian Drosophila that use decaying parts of these ferns as their egg-laying and larval breeding site. There are species that use flowers, like this morning glory flower, for example. There is a species of this group of flies, uh, a different species on each island. Kauai has a species that breed on morning glory. On Oahu, there's a different species that breed on morning glory, and so on down the line. There's also um, a couple of species of Hawaiian Drosophila that use uh, the silver sword flower as their egg-laying and larval breeding site. 
And this one is kind of interesting because um, some of you may know that uh, these silvasaurids grow in Haleakala Crater, inside the crater, and it's, a, again, a very extreme habitat. Probably rainfall is, is very minimal there. And only plants like uh, the silver sword, which is well adapted to this environment, this harsh environment, can grow there. But silver sword plants are in this vegetative state. This, these, the leaves of the plant is down here. And they're in this vegetative stage for sometimes 10 or 15 years before this flower uh, inflorescence is put out by the plant. And there could be periods inside of Haleakala where um, there are no silver sword plants which has these flowers. And this is, the flowers are the only place where these flies will lay their eggs and, and the larvae can breed. So, and there could be periods of a year or two years sometimes where there are no plants, no silver sword plants with flowers. So where are the flies in the meantime? We don't know. It's a mystery to us. And it's, it's, it's a piece of research that uh, some graduate students someday will have to pursue in trying to determine where the flies go during periods when there are no silver sword plants in Haleakala, which have flowers. There are some species that use fungi. This is a bracket fungus growing on, the, on a, a branch. Uh, we have about um, 80 or so species that are um, very specific to laying their eggs and feeding and also the larvae breeding in fungi. Uh, that's found in the, in the rainforest. Here's a piece of fungus that we found in the big island of Hawaii. This is a tremendous fungus. It's, it's growing on a, a koa tree. This fungus is about um, three feet across in diameter here at the, at the base, and it's about four feet tall uh, at, um, in height. And so here's a tremendous resource on which these flies can feed and lay eggs. There's even a few species of Hawaiian Drosophila that have become predaceous on spider eggs. And here's, um, here's a very small larva, here's an egg mass of a native spider, and the Hawaiian Drosophila will lay their eggs on this egg mass. Here's a, a, a tiny larva that had just hatched from its egg. Here's a little bit larger larva, here's a pupa case that have already gone through development, have already fed on all of the eggs of the, of the spider. So here's another very peculiar adaptation to becoming predaceous on spiders uh, in the Hawaiian ecosystem. Another very surprising discovery for Hawaiian Drosophila, or Drosophila in general, is that we may have a case where Drosophila has invaded the aquatic habitat. Um, this uh, was a field trip that had, we had taken about 15 years ago, I think, 10 or 15 years ago in which we were um, crossing the stream in the Kohala Mountains. It took us three days to get to this stream. We were riding on muleback, carrying all of our gear. And as we were crossing the stream, we noticed that there were a lot of flies sitting on these boulders. And um, when we got down on our hands and knees and we collected some of these flies, it turned out to be a drosophila, a drosophila type fly. We couldn't figure out what it was doing here sitting in the stream, in the middle of the stream, until we started to scrape below the surface of the water got some green algae and found some larvae um, feeding on the algae. And when we took our hand lens and looked at the larvae, it looked like a Drosophila larvae. So we collected several bagfuls of the algae and some water and the larvae, put them back onto our mules and rushed back to our car and got back to Honolulu to try to rear out the adults to confirm that it is indeed a Drosophila breeding in the aquatic e ecosystem. Unfortunately, by the time we got back to Honolulu, <coughs> um, all of the larvae had suffocated and died. So we, we were not able to confirm that this is a, uh, another new adaptation for Drosophila into the aquatic habitat. And again, someday, one of these students will have to, uh, some, someone young and energetic can hike back into the Kohala Mountains to make another collection with some battery-powered aerator so that they can bring back these larvae alive. Just to give you one more example of um, the ecology of, of these flies, this is a, what we call a slime flux. It's a um, sap that's coming out from this tree, which is a myoporum tree. It's one of the 
native plants in this very dry forest that I talked to you about earlier on. And when you find one of these slime fluxes and you examine it closely, you can find some flies, um, some uh, Hawaiian drosophila that's feeding, the adults that's feeding on the slime flux. And there are two very close species of these picture wing drosophila that we can collect feeding on the slime flux. If you were to take uh, a knife or some chisel and cut open the bark, you can find these tiny larvae um, underneath the bark feeding on the slime flux material. And for about two years, uh, we've, we focused on studying the slime flux ecology uh, of the Hawaiian Drosophila. And we collected nearly 200 samples of slime flux material, brought them back to the laboratory here, and tried to rear out the adults. And every time, we reared out only one species of the picture wings. And we couldn't figure out where the second species was breeding until we came across a situation like this. Uh, this is a branch. This is where the slime flux is coming out of this branch. And if you look down here where this whistle is, here's a close up. This spot here is where the slime flux is dripping down into the soil from above the, the tree above. And you can see here, as I said, this is a very dry habitat. And again, it's usually so dry that the soil is like talcum powder. But now if you were to clear away some of the leaf litter and stick your hand underneath the soil, you can dig up a sort of a cake of soil that's sort of stuck together by the sticky, gooey slime flux material that's dripping from the, the tree. And if you were to break that cake of soil open, there was the larvae of the second species that we couldn't find uh, on the tree. So here's a very classical example of how two very closely related species of Hawaiian drosophila are, are essentially utilizing the same uh, breeding site, the slime flux material, but one lays its egg on the tree and the other lays its eggs in the soil, and they do this to avoid competition. If they were using exactly the same resource, all on the tree trunk, for example, uh, one will outcompete the other and, and the other species will probably go extinct. But in this way, by being able to lay their eggs in two different places, you have two very closely related species that are able to coexist in the same very harsh, dry habitat, like in Boakaloa. So, with all of this uh, differences in the ecology and the diversity of habitats that I just talked about, um, uh, it, it, it's really a, a terrific example of explosive speciation and adaptive radiation to these different uh, e ecological and environmental um, uh, habitats. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that it's not natural selection and adaptation to the, en to the environment, uh, to temperature, to um, uh, humidity or rainfall that's been the most important for the speciation process of these species. And rather, I, I want to go back to the slides now. What it turns out, um, well, let me, let me show you this um, chromosome first. We've examined the chromosomes um, of, these, of these flies, or we can look at the details of the banding patterns of the chromosomes and um, do some ana analysis of these banding patterns and show relationships between species based on these studies. We can also look at the various genes, um, the enzymes that, um, that can be found in these flies by, uh, what you do is you grind up the flies uh, in a special buffer solution and you place, uh, you soak up those juices of the fly and place them um, uh, on a piece of um, um, filter paper, place them on a starch gel. This is a piece of starch gel on one end of the gel like this and run an electric current. And depending on the size and the charge of the molecules that we're looking at, it'll move a certain distance up on this gel. And this one happens to be the enzyme called alpha glycerol uh, phosphate dehydrogenase. That's what this code stands for. And, and you can see that these four individuals here, one, two, three, four, these, spot, these four spots are um, slightly different in size of molecule or charge of the molecule from all of the other uh, specimens on this um, starch gel. 
So it tells us that genetically these four individuals are slightly different. So as a, I just wanted to make the point that we can do chromosome studies, we can do studies of the um, enzymes and um, using starch gel electrophor electrophoresis, um, DNA studies, and so on to look at the genetics. But it turns out that the most important um, differences that we see in these flies is in the complex mating system. And it's the shifts in the mating system or changes within the sexual environment that has been the most important, at least during the initial stages of species formation. So we focus a lot of our work in the last uh, 15 or 20 years now in analyzing the genetics of the mating behavior. Yeah, and the, and the um, tremendous morphological difference, all the structures in the wings and the head and so on, are really the manifestation of the complex mating behavior. And I'll show you some of this in a, in a minute. Uh, so we have things like the antennal structure between the male and the female. The female have these long hairs on the antenna, and the male have this very long whip-like antenna and very fine hairs. Or there may be, on the front legs, the males have these very long hairs, whereas the, the female has almost no um, uh, large bristles on the, on the leg. And there are these very significant sexual differences between the male and the female in the morphology. All of these characters are used in the courtship and mating behavior. Um, in this particular species, you can see on the mouth parts, they've got these long stalks uh, with some bristles at the end. And again, these um, stalks or these almost toothpick looking uh, features are used in the courtship behavior. Here, here's a good example of how different um, the um, morphology of the two sexes can be. This is a male and this is a female of Drosophila nigri basis. And the wing pattern you can see is quite different. It's very dark and almost black in the male. And you can see there's some big clear spots in the female. And it's this kinds of differences between the sexes that for many years had us confused because when we collected females like this, we, couldn't, we didn't know that it, uh, it was the female of, of these males. And it was not until we were able to collect live females like this from the, from the field bring them back to the laboratory, got them to lay eggs. And when we got the sons of these females looking like this, it was only then that we were able to put these two uh, sexes together. Now uh, here's another two species, both from the Big Island of Hawaii, and I'm gonna talk about the behavior of these. And you can see that morphologically, look at the head of this one, it's almost like a hammerhead, and this one is a normal sized head. Very distinctive morphologically, and yet genetically, they're extremely closely related. The chromosomes are almost identical. Um, the DNA studies show that they're very, very similar. And yet, when you look at the behavior, this is the one with the small head, Drosophila sylvestris, uh, male-male interaction. The male gets up on its hind legs. It grapples with its middle and forelegs, locks head, is, and it's almost like sumo wrestling. On the other hand, Drosophila heteronura, the one with the big head, is almost flat to the ground, it spreads both wings, it touches wingtip to wingtip, and it pushes against each other like two, uh, two rams, for example. Now, the courtship behavior is very spectacular in some of these species. In this particular species, Drosophila claviciti from the island of Maui, this is a fly now, this is not a scorpion. He's actually bending his abdomen up and over his head it's producing a little bubble here, which is a chemical pheromone. It's a chemical um, stimulus, which he uh, is transmitted toward the female. And at this tip of the abdomen, there are some bristles which are flattened and fan-shaped. And he's vibrating his abdomen toward the female, wafting that pheromone toward her. And here's a frontal view. And you can see now that the abdomen is completely over. He's got his wings spread out, showing her his wings to the female as a visual display. He's rocking back and forth, dancing in front of her, and all at the same time, he's singing a song. So he's using tremendous diversity of cues from visual cues to chemical cues, tactile cues. He's sticking his mouth part out, and the female may actually kiss the male as part of the um, courtship dance. So tremendous complex um, courtship behavior, um, and it's no wonder that the Hawaiian Drosophila are called um, the birds of paradise of the insect world. So I want to 
just take a uh, just one minute break here uh, from the slides. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we have a tremendous um, fauna of plants of insects in um, in the Hawaiian Drosophila, and actually, there's been a book that was published um, back in 1982 or so. I, I forget the exact year, but it's called Island Populations, and it was uh, written by an Englishman, Mark Williamson. And I just wanted to read you a, a sentence or two from the book. Um, he wrote a whole chapter on Hawaiian Drosophilidae. And he starts out the chapter by saying, of all the groups of organisms, plants, or animals that can be studied on islands, the Hawaiian Drosophilidae are supreme. And he goes, and he says, this is why. And he goes through a whole chapter explaining why he thinks that the Hawaiian Drosophila are uh, one of the best groups for evolutionary study. And his in his conclusion, he says, any other study of evolution must surely seem inadequate after the study of the Hawaiian Drosophilidae. In no, other group of, in no other group is so much known, are there so many species, and can the ecological relationships be clarified so well? There is still an immense amount of work to be done on the group, but the work carried out so far clearly establishes their supremacy. So there's no question that the Hawaiian Drosophila has been uh, one of the most spectacular examples of adaptive radiation it has enabled us to not only test classical uh, theories and um, ideas of evolutionary biology, but it's enabled us to formulate new concepts, new ideas of evolution. Now, the, the thing is, Hawaiian Drosophila is just one family of flies that's found in the Hawaiian Islands. And there's a whole bunch of other um, insects, especially, which we have only begun to study. Uh, if we can go back to the slides again, I'll, I'll very quickly go through um, some of these other groups which we are beginning to study. Uh, before that, um, there's a, approximately 4,000 species of insects, maybe a little bit more, um, maybe close to 5,000 species of insects that are endemic to the Hawaiian Islands, found only the Hawaiian Islands. <coughs> However, it's estimated that there may be as many as 10,000 species of, of insects that are unique to the White Islands. So for the insect group as a whole, we still have a long way to go as far as naming and describing uh, these insects. Now uh, this, this is a, um, <clears throat> a fly, it's another fly, it's another group of flies which actually looks more like a house fly. Um, but there are a number of uh, unique species that's found in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, what makes this one is unique is that um, on one field trip, we saw uh, one of these flies that had captured one of our Hawaiian Drosophila and was feeding on it. Um, and we couldn't believe that it had the mouth parts to be actually preying on a, another insect, uh, which has a very hard uh, chitinous body. But when we brought these flies back to the laboratory, we dissected the mouth parts and looked inside the mouth parts. We found three pairs of teeth inside the mouth parts, which the flies can then uh, use to rasp and cut open a wound and then suck out the juices of, of its prey. So there's a whole bunch of species of predaceous flies that happen to be predaceous on some of our Hawaiian Drosophila. And that's a very interesting group that needs to be studied as well. Here's a very beautiful uh, lacewing fly, uh, bug uh, in the group called Neuroptera. And um, again, a whole bunch of species that are only beginning to be studied. In fact, there's uh, two professors from Cornell University who have been focusing their work on the, um, the, the lacewing bugs of Hawaii. That, that's a green form. Here's sort of a red colored um, species. And again, as I said, many species in this group that um, are just now beginning to be studied. Damselflies. Um, there's about 25 or 26 species of damselflies that are, are extremely interesting. And again, we're only beginning to um, understand the ecology and behavior of these, of these uh, interesting damselflies. Beetles, many different species of beetles. There are several groups of beetles uh, where there may be um, three or 400 species in, in the family. Uh, not quite as many species as the Hawaiian Drosophila, but still um, beetle species um, that 
have large numbers of species in, 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 the, in the family. This one here is called the longhorn beetle, and you can see it's got beautiful patterns on the, uh, on the wings and on the thorax, very long antenna. Here's another shot of another longhorn beetle, and you can see that it's got this very long antenna, very long, long legs, um, and almost every species of tree in the native rainforest has a beetle spe a different beetle species that uh, is associated with, with the tree species. Here's a grasshopper, a longhorn grasshopper, a, uh, what's called a Tedigoniidae. Again, uh, several species, uh, at least on each island, there's a different species. And this is very uh, interesting because it's got very small, um, non-functional wings. These are all uh, flightless um, grasshoppers. And there, there have been some studies begun on these, especially on the acoustics, the, the sounds that these um, um, grasshoppers produce. And again, a number of species with different characters. Here's one with sort of a triangle on the face and sort of a yellow mouth parts. Here's another species which has sort of a yellow face with sort of pinkish mouth parts and so on. And a lot of times um, <clears throat> it's the songs of these insects that help the taxonomist separate the different species. And a student um, did his PhD thesis research examining the ecology and acoustical signals produced by these, uh, by these grasshoppers. Crickets. There's a professor from um, the Natural History Museum in, in Pittsburgh, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, <clears throat> who has uh, devoted considerable time in Hawaii studying the native crickets. And I think he's uh, found more than 400 species of crickets that are found unique to the Hawaiian Islands. And um, there's also a, um, a researcher from Harvard University who's also doing DNA studies and doing all kinds of analysis of, the, uh, of these crickets. Now, there are some groups of insects in Hawaii um, that do not have very many species. And one of those groups is the butterflies. For some reason, the Hawaiian Islands have never had a um, uh, very many species of butterflies. There are two species of butterflies that are endemic or native to the Hawaiian Islands. One of them is this Kamehameha butterfly, and the other one is the uh, blackburn butterfly, blue butterfly, which is again not a very common butterfly, but it's, it's quite a pretty butterfly with almost fluorescent type um, blue coloring on the wings. On the other hand, the moths in Hawaii, um, especially the micro lapidot, the very small moths, um, there could be as many as a thousand species of moths that are found unique to the Hawaiian Islands. And I'm just going to show you a couple of, of these moths. Um, here's another one. And here's another one that's sort of not so nice looking. Um, this particular adult is in the family Geometridae. And I think most of us probably know it better from its caterpillar, <coughs> which you see here. And I, uh, I think maybe some of us, when we were kids, um, we were maybe the, the, uh, the name inchworm, the common name inchworm um, was mentioned to us. Um, and, and this is uh, the caterpillar of this inchworm. Now, in most places of the world, this caterpillar of this family geometridae um, are what we call phytophagous. In other words, they're vegetarian. They feed only on plants. And um, the next shot, um, the next shot is actually shows you a, it's a um, multi multi exposure shot, which shows how this caterpillar can measure out perhaps an inch at a time, it's just uh, just to show you why it's been called um, the, the inchworm. But in Hawaii, these uh, caterpillars. Um, can sometimes sit on a branch like this, for example. Th this is a caterpillar now, and uh, unfortunately, the, we don't have the right um, slides because of the problem we had earlier, but this is another, a, a piece of branch on this, uh, on this branch, and this caterpillar is mimicking the branch so that it's sort of, sort of sitting in camouflage. But what happens is that when another insect approaches the back end of this caterpillar, 
it opens up its, its huge claws and it attacks and it actually eats its prey. So here we have what we call a flesh-eating flesh caterpillar. It's, it's carnivorous. And you can see the size of this fly. It's one of our Drosophila, again, that's fallen prey to um, this caterpillar. But you can see the size of, of this uh, fly uh, relative to the size of the caterpillar. And <clears throat> this caterpillar is so voracious that it'll eat everything, the legs, the entire body, and most of the wings. And maybe, you know, there's not much meat on the wings. But if you come back in an hour later, there'll be very few pieces of this wing on the, uh, the floor of the cage. So it'll eat everything. Uh, it's, it's another very peculiar adaptation of some of our Hawaiian insects. This is a close-up of the claws that have evolved on, on this um, caterpillar, uh, which it needs to capture its prey. You know, most caterpillars that, that you find that are vegetarian have these short, stubby legs. But in Hawaii, this group of caterpillars, this group of species, have evolved these tremendous long claw-like legs uh, with which it uses to capture its prey. Spiders, um, you're going to hear more about spiders by Dr. Gillespie. I just wanted to quickly show you these happy face spiders, uh, which can be found in Hawaii. And this one even has eyebrows. And then there's uh, some spiders that have been recently discovered in lava tubes, these cave ecosystem. And this is a hunting spider. And usually, um, normally, these hunting spiders will have these large eyes. But because this one is found in caves, in a dark cave, the eyes are atrophied and are very small. And in fact, uh, uh, even more recent discovery of a cave spider, there's, almost, there's absolutely no eyes in this position. So it's. Um, it's another peculiar adaptation uh, to the cave ecosystem. Here's a cricket that's been found in the caves. And I think there'll be um, a lecture by Dr. Fred Stone, I think, that'll be talking to you about the cave ecosystem. So you'll see more of this. But here's a cricket that has absolutely no eyes. And, here, and then here's a plant hopper that's also been found in the cricket that you can see the same pale color. There's no markings on the wing which you don't need because there's no, it's so dark that you don't need any kind of visual cues in their mating or courtship behavior. But I just wanted to show this as the last, as one of the next to the last slide because uh, I wanted to show you this plant hopper which is found not in the cave but in the forest. Um, and there's two scientists from Germany that's been focusing most of their work on the plant hoppers of Hawaii and I think they've discovered something like 150 species of these plant hoppers. And the most interesting thing about these plant hoppers is their courtship song. So I wanted to, if, if this works, play you examples of the courtship song. If you can, if you can hear that, you can see that it's got a very complex and very sophisticated song that uh, the males will sing to the female as part of their courtship behavior. Let me show you, let me uh, let you listen to a second one. This is another closely related species, but the song is very different. And then I talked to you earlier about um, <clears throat> the uh, courtship song of Hawaiian Drosophila, and here's a song of one of these Drosophila species. OK, I can see that um, I'm just about 8 o'clock and we've run out of time now. so. Um, I, I just, again, wanted to give you a, a sample of the other insect species that we have in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, again, it's just a very small sample. There's many, many other insect groups for which we can do the same kinds of evolutionary type research um, that we have done already in the Hawaiian Drosophila. And it's just a gold mine out there as far as um, being able to conduct research and, and learn about the evolutionary processes. Um, this, these uh, courtship songs that we've uh, begun to 
study in the plant hoppers and the Hawaiian Drosophila. We've only begun to do that uh, maybe about five or seven years ago when a professor from Cornell University brought his uh, very sophisticated equipment um, to enable us to listen to, uh, to these insects. So, and many other areas of research that I haven't even had a chance to talk about because of the uh, time. So perhaps I'll, I'll stop here and um, uh, take any questions if there are any from, from uh, any of the vi vi viewing audience. Okay, well thank you very much for a real uh, interesting presentation, Ken. Uh, that slide of uh, uh, Waikamoi, that was uh, very interesting because it brought back some old memories. Uh, uh, Ken and I go back uh, many years and uh, we've collected out in Waikamoi and I recall one time I was with Ken collecting some uh, Drosophila in the Waikamoi rainforest there in Maui and I think I was on that very same flume and I went off the trail and going around and around in a circle on every tree fern in the circle uh, every time I stopped to a tree fern, there was a Drosophila, and we, I just kept collecting. And then the next thing I knew, I didn't know uh, where I entered from. And uh, we had to catch a, a plane, and I'd yell to Ken, and I'd hear his voice. And all of a sudden, his voice was getting shallower and shallower, and I was, found out I was going the opposite way. And, uh, and we had a plane to catch, so I, I got real worried, and, and the, the, the clouds started to come in. And, I thought I was lost, and then I found one of those metal flumes that uh, Ken showed after that other uh, walk-on flume, and then I followed that, and I, it took me back to the main flume, and uh, I got back to the trail, and we got back in time. So that particular slide brought back old memories uh, <clears throat> of the earlier days when Ken and I were out uh, collecting a lot of Drosophila flies. But uh, Ken, uh, uh, we've come to that point where uh, those of you in the viewing audience and of course those of you here in the studio can call in and ask questions and uh, Ken is an expert uh, in uh, the uh, evolutionary studies of the uh, Hawaiian drosophilid flies so if you have any questions uh, uh, please give us a call the numbers are on the screen the numbers are 974 seven, uh, 7726 and 974 7727 and of course, those of you on the outer islands, you can call us collect at 961-9046. So if you have any questions, uh, please give us a call. And if there are any uh, students in the classroom that have any questions, just raise your hand and then I'll call on you. Uh, seeing that I don't see any questions at the present time, or do you have a question back here? Sure. Okay, if you have a question, just press the button and let the green light come on. Uh, release the button and then go ahead and ask a question. Okay, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kanichiro, I was wondering is, uh, uh, are there only native uh, Hawaiian uh, dros drosophila? Drosophilids. Drosophilids, or are there also some alien ones and are they, uh, or will they interrupt in any way the ones that are already native or are there, are there no alien? ones and if there were are they it's pretty much it yes there Ken, can you elaborate on <coughs> there, that? there are about uh, two dozen species of uh, drosophilids that are introduced or alien to the Hawaiian Islands and um, for the most part we haven't found any evidence that the uh, the alien uh, drosophilids have displaced any of the endemic species but certainly there is a concern and for example up on Mount Kaala on this island um, one of the alien species, Drosophila suzukii, when we put our baits out to collect our native Drosophila, there are just tremendous numbers of Drosophila suzukii that are coming to our baits. So we're beginning to wonder now whether there might be some kind of competition that the alien species might offer to the, the native uh, Drosophilids and um, perhaps sometime down in the future uh, might, might actually create some problems in um, uh, competing, out competing some of our Drosophila and, and our native Drosophila and causing them to go extinct. But I think at, at least at the moment we don't have any clear evidence that these uh, alien Drosophilids uh, that have come in from various parts of the world have impacted greatly on the, uh, on the Hawaiian Drosophila. And we have uh, two callers on the line, so uh, will the first caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question please.
you're still with us. Hello, you're on the air. Maybe we have some technical difficulties. Uh, technicians back there, can we? Uh, yes, I have a question. Yeah, where are you calling from? Uh, from I'm calling from Hilo. Okay. I'm interested in the sounds that uh, were recorded. Yes. Are these the actual frequencies that we heard, or are they, have they been translated down to a lower frequency? Ken? They're actual recordings uh, from the actual specimens with no um, uh, adjustments to the frequency. So <clears throat> um, <clears throat> for both the plant hoppers and the Hawaiian Drosophila songs, um, most of the frequency are within the frequency that we as humans can hear. Uh, for some of the grasshopper songs, however, uh, the frequencies uh, do approach ultrasound. And so it could be that some of the sounds uh, of the grasshoppers, at least, uh, we may not be able to hear. Um, but uh, the, the acoustical um, studies that, as I said, we're just beginning, is turning out to be extremely interesting in that, at least for the Hawaiian Drosophila, uh, we've um, looked at maybe about um, three dozen species of Hawaiian Drosophila, recorded the songs, and did, did the analysis of the frequencies and the patterns, and so on. And we've actually discovered that there's four um, at least four different mechanisms of sound production, um, two of which are new to science. Um, um, one group of species will actually produce sounds with uh, two, pairs of uh, two pairs of muscles in the abdomen uh, near the junction of the thorax that are vibrating simultaneously. So it's producing sort of a pop, 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 pop type of sound, which they can modulate. So, and and it, it can go from a sound that goes like a pop, 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 pop through a prrrr. And, and that's produced when, for example, when two males begin to see each other and they start slowly pop, 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 and as they get closer and closer, they start really roaring at each other. So it, it sort of seems to be a, a, a signal of um, motivational level or something to that effect. Um, and especially when a male, for example, sees a female and as she gets closer and close, closer, this, um, this sound is sort of speeded up. Um, so we're really getting into sort of understanding some of the, um, the, the language of these courtship sounds and what they mean in, in the courtship behavior. And as sort of new to science is that for flies anyway, the frequency that they can hear is probably at the limit of about 500 hertz, 500 cycles per second. Um, anything above that, <clears throat> um, the, the um, receptor for these acoustical signals um, mechanically cannot receive these sounds anything above 500 hertz. However, we found some species of, of our Drosophila that produce sounds in the vicinity of uh, 5,000, 5 kilohertz, or 10 or 15 kilohertz, so which is much higher frequency above which the antenna, the antenna, which is the receptor, can actually detect. So if indeed these high frequency sounds produced by these flies are truly acoustical, then these flies must also have evolved a new ear, which is yet to be discovered. So again, the uh, professor, Dr. Ron Hoy from Cornell University is working together with us in doing some electrophysiology type studies in which we're putting electrodes into various um, <clears throat> tissues of, of the fly, try to determine which organ might have uh, evolved as a, a new ear to be able to detect this high frequency sound. So it's, a, it's an exciting area of research and opening up a whole, whole area of communication in the, in the insect world. I answer the question from Hilo. I, I guess it does answer the question. We do, we do have another caller. Uh, Will the next caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question for Ken? Yes, I'm uh, calling from Maui. Uh-huh. This is Forest Star. Um, I have a question about the Drosophila and the Silver Sword. Yes. And uh, just which species is it and uh, where on a Silver Sword does it frequent and uh, where do they uh, suppose it may hide when its Silver Sword is not flowering? Okay, Ken? Yeah, as I explained, um, there are two species of Drosophila, and the, um, I probably will remember, yeah, it's Drosophila ascidostoma is the Drosophila, and the Scaptomyza species, um, I don't recall right, right off the top of my head, but <clears throat> both of these species, as I said, are um, host-specific on the flowers of the silver sword. 
So if you were to collect um, <clears throat> the flowers and break them open, you may find some eggs and larvae of, the, um, of these two Drosophila species. Now, as to your question of where I think these flies might be at times when there are no silver sword flowers, I really have no idea. Um, it's been a complete mystery to us. Maybe uh, they're surviving in the pupal stage, um, but it's hard to imagine that they can survive in the pupal stage for as long as a year or two years. Uh, maybe some kind of a diapause or something like that. Um, it's, it's, it's a total mystery. Um, you know, there's almost nothing else that they could be breeding in in this very harsh habitat in Haleakala Crater. Um, no other vegetation nearby, no other kinds of slime flux or anything like that. <clears throat> um, and that's, as far as we know, is the only kind of host plant in which they could be laying their eggs and breeding. But during those periods uh, when there are no flowers on these silver swords, we have absolutely no idea where the, these flies might be. And yet, when, the, when a silver sword plant puts out a flower, it, the flies uh, turn up. To get the call so. from Maui to join your program, Ken, and uh, something to do, do some uh, research up in uh, Haleakala. More research in the future. Does that answer the question from Maui? Uh, yeah, it did. Um, I got uh, kind of an addition to that question. Are there sure. any other tar weeds that other Drosophilas can be found on up Ken? in Haleakala? Are there any t other tar weeds that uh, up in Haleakala Crater where you might be able to find some of these uh, native Drosophila? Yeah, there are other tarweed species, um, like Dubalia, for example, that are found in uh, Haleakala Crater, but so far we have not found any other Drosophila species associated with the tarweeds except for silver sword. Um, there are other insects, uh, like tephridids, um, that are found on these uh, Dubalias and silver sword together. Um, but um, as far as Drosophilids go, on any of the tarweed species, other than silver sword, we have not found um, Drosophila associated with these tar weeds. All right. Uh, question. Thank you there? Does that answer the question from Maui? It does. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks, Jack. We really appreciate your show. Thank you very much for calling. Uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, this is Agriculture 194R, focus on agriculture. And this evening we're featuring Dr. Ken Kaneshiro, who's the director uh, for the Center for Conservation Research and Training at UH Manoa. And we have another caller, so will the caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question for Ken. Hello, you're Hi. on the air. Um, I'm calling from Hana, Maui. Okay. And I'd like to know a little bit more about the uh, Maui lava tube crickets. I believe they call them Cacinamobius. I was wondering how common or how rare they are and if they make any audible sounds and also what they evolved from and how long it's taken them to evolve to their current state. Ken? Thank can you. you. Can you elaborate on that yeah, one? I, I can try to answer parts of that. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned, uh, I think it'll be Dr. Fred Stone who will be uh, talking um, a few weeks from now. Uh, and his talk will be focused on these cave ecosystems. Um, you're right, it's Cacinobobius um, <clears throat> that's found in the lava tube, and, it, and there are relatives uh, of that genus that's found outside of the lava tube, and it's presumably um, the cave um, species have, been, have evolved from these um, the terrestrial forms. But again, it's not my area of specialty. I've, I've just shown you some of these um, other groups um, just to set the stage for some of the other speakers later on in the semester. So save your question for Dr. Stone. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll have him call back when uh, Fred Stone comes on and talks about the cave ecosystem and the cave insects, uh, etc. Uh, we do have another caller, Ken. Uh, will the caller let us know where you're calling from and go ahead with the question, please. I'm calling from Kaneohe, Oahu, Dr. Fuji. Okay, and I have friend. a question for uh, this is Dr. Uh, Kanishiro, and I've been always wondering about this uh, problem. They use flies uh, for experimenting on, uh, uh, to accelerate uh, 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 different things, like their life expectancy is real short, so uh, that's a good, good uh, bug to uh, associate that with. Uh, in other words, they can make so many generations in a in a short, short while. Exactly. And I was wondering now, 
Well, what is the lifespan of that Hawaiian uh, gis, thing you call gis, Drosophila? Drosophila. Okay. And, uh, and, and for all the years that Dr. You, Dr. Kaneshiro, that you have been studying that, and you, you, you said it's something like 20 or 30, 30, I don't know how many years, but it's been a, quite a while. So that, that represents a lot of generations of that fly. Now, from the time that you started to the, to the present, uh, have you any, noticed any uh, significant uh, physical change or, uh, you know, in, in their appearance or whatever? And uh, because I like to find out, using that fly as a sample, how we human beings have evolved and changed uh, to what we are today. And uh, th so, did you see any significant change in in the fly from the day you started on starting that Hawaiian fly to today? I'll hang up and I'll listen to to your comments. Okay, thank you, Haruso Joe. Uh Maybe uh, Ken can elaborate on that uh, question. Sure, I'll, I'll try. Um, <clears throat> as far as your first question, as far as the, uh, the life cycle and uh, how long these flies can live, um, remember that small fly that I showed you uh, in one of the earlier slides, the Drosophila melanogaster, that's found um, elsewhere in the world. Their, their uh, life cycle is about seven to 10 days, depending on the temperature, um, from egg to mature adult. So they lay their eggs, uh, you get your eggs hatch, you get the larval stage, and when they close as adults, emerge as adults, it's about 10 days to two weeks, perhaps, again, depending on the temperature in which you rear them. The Hawaiian Drosophila, however, uh, and people think that because we live in the Hawaiian Islands, which is tropical, and that you can have very many generations of insects like the Hawaiian Drosophila. However, uh, many of our Hawaiian Drosophila species have a tremendously long life cycle, and it, it takes um, probably close to two months from egg to mature adult, so much longer than Drosophila melanogaster. So you have what we might have thought there might have been many generations per year for the Hawaiian Drosophila. There's actually quite fewer generations compared to Drosophila melanogaster from the rest of the world. But on, uh, as far as your second question, I mean, some of our Hawaiian Drosophila we have actually kept alive in the laboratory for 12 months. They can live a long time in the laboratory, at least. Now, as far as your second question, um, indeed, what we're doing with the Hawaiian Drosophila, the, uh, the evolutionary biology of Hawaiian Drosophila, is to try to better understand the evolution of man, ultimately, and how we have come to be what we are today. Uh, and, and to answer your specific question, in the 30 years or 35 years that I've been studying the Hawaiian Drosophila, I haven't really seen significant changes in the morphology and how they look and so on. Um, we have seen some changes in the behavior, for example, that have occurred in the laboratory in several, in several years' time. But we don't expect to see significant changes over a period of tens or 15 or 20 years. Evolutionary processes occur over a long period of time, evolutionary time, hundreds or thousands of years. Um, and most of those are at the chromosome or DNA level rather than in the morphological structures, which probably um, <clears throat> require many genes to change before you see um, changes that we can see by, by eye. So uh, to answer your question, uh, we haven't seen, you know, visually seen um, morphological changes that we can see in, in the, the body structure or wing pattern of these flies, although sometimes there's mutations which, uh, in which a marking on the wing might disappear or something like that. But uh, those are very insignificant kinds of changes as far as um, evolutionary processes go. Um, so yeah, we, we, don't really, we didn't really expect to find, it, it, within the 30 or 35 years that we've been studying these flies, um, very significant changes that we would be able to see um, by eye. But certainly, um, genetic changes um, that have occurred in the, in the laboratory, uh, mostly having to do with behavior, um, we, that's the sort of thing that we've been studying uh, in detail. We have a student here in the classroom that has a question for you. So, Tyrus, uh, why don't you go ahead with your question? Sure, I was wondering um, what the Drosophila fly eats, or what does it feed on? Does it eat what? I was wondering on what 
um, what it feeds on. Oh, okay. Uh, Ken, can you say something about uh, uh, what a lot of our Drosophila feed on? I think you mentioned a little bit about it uh, earlier, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah as I explained, um, the <clears throat> Drosophila from the rest of the world um, will breed on decaying fruits, you know, your papayas and um, mangoes and things like that. After it's fallen to the ground, it starts to decay. But the Hawaiian Drosophila, there are very few fruits in the native ecosystem that are very large uh, for these much larger Hawaiian Drosophila. And so they have actually started to breed on many different kinds of um, uh, substrates. For example, the, the decaying leaves, the rotting leaves. Um, every species of tree in the native ecosystem, for example, may have a Hawaiian Drosophila laying their eggs in the decaying leaves. The decaying branches, uh, fungi, um, and things like that. So they, they've, they actually can um, breed in a tremendous diversity of substrates in the native rainforest or even in the, in the dry forest, for example, I showed you these slime flux in which the adults and the larvae can feed on. So it's, it's, a, it's a wide range of, um, of substrates and materials that they can, they can breed in. To your question, Tyrus. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for asking the question. Uh, Ken, uh, you have a uh, graduate program over there at UH Manoa in this area of uh, evolutionary biology. Can you say uh, something about your program and what, what your graduate students are doing and uh, potentially some of our graduates here at UH Hilo may be interested in your program and graduate studies and uh, maybe you might uh, say a few words about your graduate program. Thanks, Jack, for giving me that chance to sort of um, give some publicity to the graduate program that we've developed at uh, UH Manoa. The program is called Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology. It is strictly a graduate program at the moment, although there is a uh, undergraduate track in the biology program also called Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation Biology. <clears throat> but the, uh, the main program is a graduate program which focuses on um, ecology and evolution and conservation biology. Uh, we, this is a relatively new program. We started in 1991 with three students. Um, and even though most other departments are, have declining enrollment, our program have gone from three students in 1991 to nearly 60 students uh, today. So it's one of the fastest growing programs. And, and also, um, I don't mind bragging that uh, we probably have some of the top students in the biological sciences in this program. We're attracting students um, who are receiving their undergraduate degrees from uh, Yale and Berkeley and um, Cornell, uh, Princeton, um, all applying to come to their graduate program, graduate degree at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and and the, the reason for that is obvious. Um, Hawaii is the best place in the world to uh, do research and be educated in evolutionary biology. And, and these students uh, from these top um, universities across the mainland are, are wanting to come to Hawaii to be able to have the opportunity to go out into the field, um, not just the Hawaiian Drosophila, but the plants and the birds and, and the other organisms um, <clears throat> that will enable them to better understand evolutionary processes. Now that you've uh, tooted your horn, uh, it's time for me to toot my horn. Uh, the College of Agriculture uh, has changed its name. The legislature authorized the uh, University of Hawaii at Hilo to change the name of the College of Agriculture to the College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management. So uh, because we changed that name, I've decided to uh, have this series of uh, focus on agriculture this semester to focus on our natural resources and conservation biology. And we hope in the near future to uh, develop the area of natural resource management here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And we hope to have a undergraduate program in that particular area. And hopefully when it gets started uh, that we will graduate some excellent students here from UH Hilo uh, to go to UH Manoa to go into your uh, graduate program over there. But uh, what I'd like to also uh, indicate, uh, Ken, uh, say if uh, Charles Darwin came to Hawaii 
uh, instead of the Galapagos Island. What, what do you think uh, Darwin would have thought if he came to Hawaii versus the Galapagos? Um, <clears throat> the, the difference between uh, what we find in Hawaii and the Galapagos, for example, the birds, uh, the Darwin's finches, the very famous Darwin's finches, we have um, probably equally or maybe more spectacular example of adaptive radiation in these birds. And I'm sure he would have made similar observations and probably came to the same kinds of uh, conclusions about evolutionary processes uh, um, based on what he saw in the Hawaiian Islands. But of course, we don't have the other large um, vertebrate species, the, the tortoises uh, that's found in the Galapagos, um, uh, the iguanas, and so on. Um, other than the birds, there's only one other mammal, which is the Hawaiian bat. Uh, we don't have any large ungulates or anything like that that are native to the Hawaiian Islands. Most of these other things are these tiny insects, which um, still, if, we, if he had the right tools to do the kinds of research that we're able to do today, uh, the genetic tools, the modern molecular tools, and uh, being able to observe behavior like we have with the Hawaiian Drosophila, he, he, he again would probably have been able to come to the same kinds of conclusions that he did based on his observations of um, the Galapagos. But, so, you know, so I, again, maybe I'm biased, but I think um, the, the organisms, the species, the uh, plants of animals that we have in Hawaii offer a much, much greater opportunity to really do a more in-depth analysis of the genetic basis of, of um, evolution um, like we have with the Hawaiian Drosophila. And um, again, maybe I'm biased and because I'm from Hawaii and um, um, understand the, the tremendous diversity of fauna and flora that we have here in Hawaii. So Ken, uh, I know you said you were doing some uh, gel electrophoresis. Uh, are you starting to do any uh, PCR work uh, uh, in your uh, evolutionary studies uh, at the present time? And maybe you might explain PCR to those that uh, about it. Sorry, I, I didn't hear Oh, Ken, I was just wondering if you use the uh, PCR method of uh, analyzing DNA and replicating DNA to uh, study the uh, evolution of our uh, native insects and, and, and the kind of work that you're doing. Yeah, uh, again, molecular biology is not my particular area of um, uh, expertise, but there, there are uh, quite a number of people um, in the genetics laboratory, also in the um, zoology department, who are using molecular tools and this PCR, this polymer, uh, polymerase chain reaction technique that you just mentioned um, in conducting their studies, um, evolutionary phylogenetic studies, um, to again better understand the evolutionary processes involved in the um, uh, adaptive radiation and the speciation uh, of these native organisms. Yeah, uh, it's, again, it's an, another modern tool that is being used extensively by many researchers, not just here in Hawaii at Manoa but, um, and at Hilo, but um, all throughout the world. It's, it's, it's an important tool that's uh, being used to do these kinds of studies, and we are doing them on the Hawaiian Drosophila. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and sharing all your knowledge of uh, your 30 plus years of experience with the Hawaiian Drosophilidae. I'd just like to remind everyone that next Thursday we're going to have Dr. James Jacoby, research from the uh, U.S. Geological Survey here on the Big Island, and he'll be talking about our native Hawaiian plants and their ecosystems. So this is Jack for GE saying thank you for watching Focus on Agriculture and we hope to see you next Thursday evening. And uh, thank you for watching and good evening.